Hello and welcome to Working Scientist, a Nature Careers podcast. I'm Julie Gould. This is the third episode of the series called The Last Few Miles, planning for the late stage career in science. People who are scientists often do so because they felt a calling at a young age. I've lost count of how many scientists I've spoken to over the years who said they wanted to be scientists from when they were kids watching snails in their gardens or something similar. But that means that being a scientist is not just an ordinary nine to five job. It's an all consuming part of who these people are. It's a major part of their identity, which is understandable. But when it comes to retirement, a point at which you might leave a lot of what it means to be an academic behind, it can often leave scientists feeling unsure about who they are or who they're going to be. And that's what we'll explore in this third episode of The Last Few Miles. Some people are very happy to retire, like Roberto Coulter, Professor Emeritus at Harvard Medical School in the USA, who embraced retirement with open arms and sees it as a chance for him to explore new things in his life. Yeah, for me, it's an enormous amount of new opportunities. It uh, is a change in the way I uh, live my life because research was such a big part of it and overseeing, training a group of individuals. In many ways, for me, it means broadening enormously what, uh, what I can do in terms of my scientific interest and the people that I interact with as becoming much broader. So I see it nothing short of really a a very expansive move that uh, gives me the freedom uh, to explore many, 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 many more areas than I ever did before. It also gives me a little bit of control, a little bit more control over really what I love to do versus what I think I have to do. It sounds like you're enjoying it a lot. And the answer is very much. (laughs) Oh, good. I'm so pleased. Absolutely. I'm so pleased. But, of course, everyone is different. So it's not like this for everyone. This is what Shirley Tarman, previous president and emeritus professor at Princeton University in the USA, found as she worked on a paper for the American Society of Cell Biology on Second Acts. As part of the research, she spoke to many retiring and retired biologists and found out that when there's talk of retirement, it's understandable that there are some concerns, maybe even fears, about what it means for who they are and who they're going to be. I think there was a lot of fear. I think that was one of the things we heard, even from those who had sort of embraced the idea of retirement early. And we attribute this in large part to the fact that science is such a demanding career, that if you are doing academic science, and I think this actually applies whether you're, you know, a a well-recognized principal investigator or whether you are a research associate in someone else's laboratory. Science is pretty all consuming and it didn't leave people, this this is their perception, a lot of time to think about what is ahead. Inga Mewburn, Director of Research and Development at the Australian National University, thinks that some of this fear is deeply rooted in academic culture. We came from monasteries. Like, so maybe that's just really deep in our culture of, of that idea of a vocation, of that's your life's work. And there's something about work that helps people that's incredibly compelling and gives you a sense of purpose and a sense of being valued and a sense of belonging to something bigger than self, than yourself in the kind of face of all the existential angst, which let's face it, the world is full of so much existential angst. Um, if you can focus on every day going and doing a job where you feel like, you know, you're unpacking the mysteries of the universe, you're teaching someone how to be a better doctor, you're, you know, uncovering manuscripts from the, de- like there, there's there's a lot of, it that's compelling and it's meaningful. And I think I don't know how you give that up really. Pat Thompson, a part-time professor of education at the University of Nottingham, agrees and says it's part of who you are when you're an academic. I guess it's about professing, isn't it? I mean, you know, I'm a professor, we profess things. So 
you know, you profess either as a, as a scientist and your passion for science and getting things done, or in my case, you, you profess about education through writing about it and, and doing it. So it, it is about, you know, what else you are. Dame Athene Donald, the current Master of Churchill College at Cambridge University in the UK, is going through this right now. In September of 2024, her term as the Master of Churchill College ends after a 10-year period. This will be her second retirement of sorts. In 2020, Athene retired from her professorship position at the university, where they have a mandatory retirement age of 67. As an aside, the University of Cambridge, Oxford University and St Andrews University in the UK are the only universities here that have a mandatory retirement age. OK, back to Athene. At that point, I essentially had no choice but to retire from that role. It was during the pandemic, so I just kind of faded out. So, you know, you can imagine there was no, nothing to market, if you like. It just, I ceased to be a professor, got a pension. I did feel there was a loss of identity associated with that. I find it very strange that I felt like that, given I had another job, which technically wasn't full time, but it was very absorbing. And yet I still felt I, you know, you're you're an academic for so long. That, that when it ceases, particularly it ceases without any rite of passage that, uh, you know, a formal party in the department or, a, you know, my retirement conference would have been. There was just nothing. I just sort of ceased to be in a certain way. But it's very hard to put one's finger on what that meant. And I knew, I knew a long time ago that retirement would bother me because I think one's identity is tied up in it, that I think... Yeah, you know, I have worked phenomenally hard during my life and the idea that one day it would just stop. You know, what are you meant to do after that? How does one almost justify one's existence after you cease to be contributing as a useful member of society? I can empathise with Athene's perspective here, but I just want to add that Athene is still very much a useful member of society and to the academic community. She continues to advocate for women in science and last year published a book called Not Just for the Boys, Why We Need More Women in Science. But now that Athene is approaching her second formal retirement, all these feelings and questions of identity are resurfacing. The the feeling of retirement associated with leaving the department has faded, but I'm just going through it again because as Master of Churchill College, I had a 10-year stint and that is now coming to an end, so... Come September, I will have no formal job stroke role at all. So, yeah, and I'm very much thinking, okay, now what? Um, And trying to work out what a suitable new balance could be because, you know, I'm getting on. I'm not as energetic as I was. Um, In fact, I had a a very nasty infection over Easter, which I'm still recovering from, and I feel that's that's taken a lot out of me. So maybe I don't want to fl- work, work flat out, but on the other hand, the idea of stopping I find unnerving. So what can scientists and academics do to help ease that transition into retirement? What can they do to reduce some of those potential nerves? Some people have things lined up, ready and waiting for them. And this was Shirley Tarman's situation when she retired from working in the lab in 2001. She wasn't worried at all. Because I had something immensely exciting and challenging to look forward to. And this is part of, even though I didn't plan this, um, it, it, you know, I had something that was going to occupy 110% of my waking moments. The work she's referring to here is becoming the president of Princeton University. When I finally became emerita in 2021, it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I was teaching on Zoom or I was teaching with with a mask on. Teaching during the pandemic, I found really unpleasant. And it was exactly the push that I needed um, to say that's it. Some people have developed hobbies alongside their working careers that then become part of who they are and that they look forward to spending more time doing. For example, Pat Thompson thinks that there are elements of her academic work that she will continue doing whilst being retired. But her real focus is on something totally unrelated. And I think the things I like about um, academic work are 
are actually research and writing and teaching. What I can do without are um, a lot of the institutional um, sort of requirements that, that you have to meet. And I'll probably continue to do some of that in, in writing and publication. But I would like, I guess, just to feel more in charge of what it is that I do and actually spend more time doing other things. What sort of other things would you like to do? Well, now we come to my plan. So I've always made things, even in performance. You know, I would make costumes and props and play around with the sound and the lighting and whatever. So I've I've always done things with my hands. I've always been very, very busy. I hate having idle hands. And I've also had a terribly... Um, a terribly expensive silver jewellery habit. So a few years ago, about five or six years ago, I decided that what I needed to do was to make my own jewellery. And so I went I went to jewellery classes um, quite very regularly and did jewellery summer schools. Um, and so one of the things that I want to spend a lot more time doing is actually making jewellery before my hands get too decrepit to do it. Um, I've got lots of ideas. What I don't want to do is a third career as a jeweller, and I'm str currently struggling with how to manage actually making a volume of things um, without having to get into um, actually running a business. So that's my current plan. Another thing that Pat feels strongly about is her identity as a female researcher. She started teaching at a time when it was only just possible for married women to become teachers and equal pay was becoming a reality. And when I guess it was still considered really important for women to have a have a career, have, be able to have a career and to be able to do things on their own. So I kind of feel like, you know, since I left school, I've always worked and I've always had my own money and I've always decided what I'm going to do with myself. And that's been really important to my identity. And so I think partly what retirement means is, you know, I'm not going to be working anymore. So you know, what am I going to, what, what actually is it? Am I, am, am I going to be? Well, I mean, you know, of course I've, you know, I'm not I'm not going to be living in abject poverty and obviously I've still, you know, I've, st I've still got an income that I can I can take charge of. But but I think the notion of kind of work and my identity as a kind of educator um, and as a, a, a woman in the workforce has been pretty significant. And so I think that's actually the hardest transition. So Pat is currently thinking about what parts of her working academic identity she's able to let go of. You know, occasionally I wonder to myself if, you know, having this vast number of things that I, I still think I have to write, you know, and I'll, I'll just, you know, slightly humble brag here and say, you know, I've I've written 27 books so far and I've got, you know, another four underway and probably another four in my head. Um you know, that that's probably going to be the hardest thing to actually let go of. I think I can let go of the blog fairly, fairly, in a fairly straightforward kind of way. And I've been, you know, publishing that for every week for 13 years. Um, but I think it's going to be the books that are going to be the most significant kind of indicator that I've actually stopped doing that and now I'm now I'm somebody else and I'm doing something else. That's who I used to be. For Inga Mewburn, it's not yet clear what she will be doing. Her hobby is podcasting, but her podcasts are about her job. You know, it's not like a podcast about knitting or kittens or something. So I think, yes, that's a lot of us are guilty of um, myself, my job, and this is who I am. I can't ever imagine, when I think about retirement, to go back to what you asked me before, when I think about retirement, it's not not doing the work it's not doing the kind of minutiae and being a manager and all those kind of things it's, but the intellectual side of it I can't ever imagine giving that up but I guess that's part of retiring I do often joke and I'm not really joking I'm semi-joking that my next career is as a romance novelist and then, and I try and write romance novels in my spare time but I just can't like my brain won't do it because I'm so used to writing boring stuff right so I think well maybe I just need to retire so I'm not doing that but I'm still a writer so I suppose it depends what kind of 
bits of your identity you're carrying through. Roberto Coulter, the emeritus professor from Harvard Medical School, spent a lot of time talking to his peers when he was preparing for his retirement in 2018, and he heard many of them express their fears about it. He believed that it was because they hadn't experienced any things outside of their academic research. They focused so heavily on their scientific career that they forgot to develop other interests. When I caught up with Roberto this year, I asked him again how he felt about identity and retirement. Did you ever have any thoughts about identity and your own self and, and how you were and who you were as a person? <laughs> you know, I, every day I wake up, I wonder who am I, but that's okay. <laughs> so the first thing, a little bit of insecurity is okay. Uh, you know, questioning whether it was the right move. It's, it's okay. It's all right to question things. And, and I think it's a healthy process. My advice for people who are beginning to think about it is diversify early, really come up with different interests. So I was already thinking about museum exhibits and writing a book several years before retirement. So, so whether it's growing orchids or, you know, uh, wanting to design new sun watches, I'm saying sun, cl sun clocks because I see that some people do this or whether it's just simply being a, in a different uh, activity, but still involved in, in my case, in microbiology, right? So I, I, it's, it's, it's what I do. I, I love it. So, but I knew that I had a spot that was the new me as it were, right? And that was a, tra it was a transition. It wasn't, it was a slow transition. It wasn't from one day to the next. I think that's the, that's key to begin to realize you're not just the head of a lab okay. and do that while you're still the head of a lab. Roberto, as we've heard in previous episodes of this series, thoroughly enjoys the new opportunities that retirement has brought him. He's travelled, is still going to conferences. And in fact, when I spoke with him this year, he was in Denmark at a conference. So you're currently, even though you're retired from the, the sort of the, the employed part of your academic life, you are still heavily involved. As we speak, you're in Denmark at a conference. So tell me a little bit about where you are and why you're there. So I'm here at the conference. It at um, uh, north of Copenhagen, a conference on, on secondary metabolites and the ecological role that secondary metabolites from bacteria play. And uh, it's, it's more interesting why I, I am here. So, you know, one of the first things that I did in, after retiring is I received a fellowship for a sabbatical, actually a short sabbatical in, at the Danish University, the Technical University. And uh, Lone Graham was hosting me. And she was just starting at the time, this is 2019, a uh, program on focus, a really big, big project, uh, many labs uh, focused on what are the ecological roles of the secondary metabolites. And so she asked me uh, to come here and give the keynote address yesterday, last night. So that was wonderful and uh, lots of uh, positive feedback from that talk. And I should say the day before on Saturday, I was giving a talk in Asti in Northern Italy, uh, on a completely different topic, which was the cities of the future and how we might learn from microbes and how they organize and how they've evolved to organize in terms of city planning. And just two days before that, I was in Marburg at the Max Planck giving a talk on what, what can we do about the problem of antibiotic resistance. All of that is to say, it's not to brag, but it's to say that one can be very active and can be a participant in the community. And it frees me to give strong opinions, uh, really because, uh, hey, uh, I can truly ex express my opinion without the concerns that uh, people who might review my papers might not like what I say, you know, might not like what I might say, or, or somebody applying for a grant might want to get my favor because they know I'm in it. So having all of that gone, it really gives a certain amount of freedom in both what we talk about and uh, what we speculate on. Yeah, and really in fact, I'm, uh, oh, that sorry. two days from now, I'm going to go to Germany and give a talk to youngsters on my career, you know, because it, the people want to hear about what I've done with my life. In order to enjoy retirement like this, as we heard Inge Muben say in episode one of this series, is to make sure you're prepared. But it's difficult to make preparations on your own. So in the fourth episode of this series, we'll hear how people have reached out to others for help and advice when it comes to getting close to retirement, whether it's from peer groups or the institution that you're working for. Thanks for listening. I'm Julie Gould. 